Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Lenore Von Stein, and this is yet another episode of The Facts. Uh, and today we're, we have, we're, have a discussion episode. You know, The Facts is music, some episodes, stories with music, and some episodes talking to interesting people. And so this is one of the interesting people one. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm talking to Baz Dreisinger, who is... Baz, actually. Baz, Baz. <laughs> I, I've been working on this Common name. mistake. <laughs> it's okay. And uh, Baz is a, a, a professor of English at John Jay College of, for Criminal Justice, which is actually across the street from where we're filming this. And uh, she also uh, is the writer of a, a book called uh, Incarceration Nations. Um, and uh, so w what we're going to talk about today is is justice or law and why laws exist and why some crimes are crimes sometimes and not crimes other times and the results of treating people in in whatever ways you treat them when they've been they've committed these crimes or you think there's enough evidence to mm -hmm. uh, claim that they've committed these crimes so uh, can I uh, why do some things change right some things are crimes and some things are not crimes given a society? I mean, some of this is quite evident. Is there some way that you could help fill in on this? Sure. No, I think it's so important to ask these questions because the fact of the matter is most people don't and take a lot of these very basic concepts of justice for granted. But I think for one, um, it's about distinguishing between, between legal and moral. And again, that's a distinction most people don't think about. But there are lots of things that we might say are legal that are not moral and vice versa. And I think societies historically have defined those things in different ways and also have sometimes made legal and moral the same thing, perhaps in a religious governed society mm -hmm. um, and have sometimes separated those things. So, I mean, adultery is a, is a classic example. Is that a crime? No, not necessarily. Although in some countries it still is as a result of the uh, religious moral codes that many of these countries some come from. Some professions it is too, right? That you is true, know. yeah. Um, but that's, I think, a perfect example of that. A, a crime like murder has always been unequivocally wrong across the board and uh, and yet, at the same time, there are even subcategories of murder, depending on the society. An honor killing, for instance, versus a wanton act of murder. Um, but murder is definitely one of those categories where moral and legal have tend to, tended to conflate. So um, I think it's a really complicated question that takes us across history, takes us across nationalities. I mean, for, for my book, I spent a lot of time in, in different countries, prison systems. Um, and so you realize that it's not the same country to country. Uh, drugs is another really good example of that. Many drugs have not been uh, considered illegal until certain times and places. And usually that conflates with issues around uh, race and oppression. Opi Opioids, for instance, and the Chinese population in in Singapore and uh -huh. in the U.S. Um, we can certainly see that around crack in the U.S., how it was criminalized as a result of it being defined as a black drug and thus used as another form of oppression and racism. So drugs is definitely a place where, we're, where we see things um, shift from era and also shift from context and, and nationality. How does it, it when when people are in, in incarcerated in, in the different ways that they're treated during the time that they are incarcerated? Uh, for instance, on there's a lot of TV shows that make a big thing about how bad you're going to you know how bad you're going to have it once you're in the who's gal. Uh, how does that uh, how does that go, suss out when the for the not only obviously it's not good for the person who goes to jail, but how does it suss out for society as a whole? Uh, when the person gets out, when the person doesn't get out, you know, this thing about treating people really badly mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, who have been uh, convicted of some crime or other. 
Well, again, I think it's about another critical distinction, and that's the distinction between punishment and corrections. And we call, I mean, in the US, we talk about a department of corrections. We do not talk about a department of punishment. So theoretically, we are invested in correcting people, or what we call rehabilitation. And that's a term I don't like, because most people in our prison system have not been habilitated in the first place, because they weren't given access to opportunities. So there's no rehabilitation. It's more habilitation. But um, I think the question is, are we investing in punishment? And punishment being, in my mind, and this is how I think of punishment, punishment is sort of inherently immoral because what it is is it's saying, we're going to tell you not to harm, to do harm by doing harm to you. That's mm -hmm. what punishment yes, is. Yes. And, and as opposed to corrections, as opposed to rehabilitation, uh, as opposed to repair, um, I think of it as the revenge versus repair philosophy. And there is, I think that throughout history and context, obviously the world is a big place and history is 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 massive entity, but throughout there's been distinctions between are we engaging in repair in our society when someone harms someone else or are we engaging in revenge? And in this country, I certainly think, and this is what, what many of us who do this work think is one of the big problems of this country, we are invested in a system of punishment and harm uh, and not as a department of corrections, as we call ourselves. So it's actually a misnomer. And how does revenge suss out in terms of what happens to these people when they leave or what happens to... What do they do to each? I mean, the idea that rape is running wild inside a prison system is just—it it, it makes my—it it makes me crazy. I mean, why would you you take responsibility for these human beings and then you put them in this very dangerous situation, uh, and and you you know you say hallelujah, you know? Absolutely, and we do celebrate that um, in in so much of our pop culture. There are jokes about uh, dropping the soap in prison, and you know, there's comedy around this, and and it's atrocious because what you're talking about again is something this punishment system whereby you're saying you did harm so we're gonna hurt you and the thing about revenge is that it's a cycle of harm and it's a cycle um, it's a corrupt cycle that ultimately destroys the fabric of a society and does not ultimately satisfy a victim either and I think this is the key thing right the other binary that our society is so invested in is this idea of victim and offender not recognizing that the bulk of people involved in the criminal justice system are both uh, and that when a society is fragmented, when a particular community is broken because of lack of opportunity, because of systemic poverty and systemic racism, that what you're doing is producing um, a, a dysfunctional situation whereby people are moved into crime, they're both victimized, and they're engaging in harmful acts. And it's this horrible cycle. And then you throw them in prison, commit further harm against them, damage them further, have them come home to their communities further damaged, and engage in this cycle of crime and harm uh, again, and this cycle of revenge again. And so you really have to think about it on a moral level um, and on a safety level. Who is it benefiting? No one. Uh, and victims again and again, and this is something that I find so interesting, the research around victims is needs. I just actually um, read a new study that was done in California around crime victims and their needs and what ultimately meets those needs, right? Because that's who we're supposed to be caring about yes. when we talk about a justice system. And again and again, it's been shown that, that the traditional criminal justice system from the court system on down to prison sentences is not generally bringing victims the healing that they deserve and that they they, they long for and that theoretically a justice system is supposed to provide. Uh, and there are other paradigms that we need to think about. I'm a big advocate for restorative justice, um, for thinking about, again, repair as opposed to revenge uh, as a much more just, humane, and uh, productive system of justice. So, so I'm a let's say you're 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 a woman who's been raped, and the restorative justice model. What would that be in terms of they 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 apprehend the person who committed the crime, who's often somebody you know in that case. Uh, what would what would work to be to to work best for you as well as work well for in, in this well model? yeah I think I mean I don't think that there's one absolute there's it's a case by case basis but I think overall the idea being so you know if you have suffered that 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 vile thing of having been raped um, for one we know that you're in some ways when you're dragged through the court system you're further victimized you don't necessarily have a voice in those proceedings you're not heard we know one of the needs of victims is to be heard to be listened 
listened to, to be understood, to have uh, s the person who harmed them understand that you have harmed me. That's not always possible given, you know, levels of comprehension of people who commit acts, but, you know, at least the attempt is there. Um, but what if you were harmed deeply in such a way as that, and you had the opportunity to, if you felt up to it, confront your victim, engage in victim offender dialogue, um, and then determine a system of reparations that benefited you, whether it's financial reparations, whether it's this person having to work in, in some capacity, give from the rest for the rest of his life to a domestic violence shelter or a domestic violence uh, home, uh, in whether in a capacity as a volunteer or perhaps financial remuneration. Uh, and then you were given all kinds of, of the profound healing services that you need in order to recover from such an awful act as that. Uh, I don't know what it's necessarily going to do for you to have someone languish in a prison cell, have our tax dollars spent, further traumatize this person who may have already been traumatized. Many people who are committing um, sexual offenses are victims of, of sexual yes. offenses themselves, study, and study after study has shown. So again, we're talking about this cycle of harm, but when we really focus on the repair of the victim and the victims' needs and a different paradigm, I think that there's exciting possibilities. Now, I, I don't have all the answers. I can't sit and devise exactly what that game plan would be, but I do know that there, there are a lot of innovative thinkers in the field of justice right now working on this so now. One of the things I hear from you is that one of the, the issue, and it, it seems it's it just the, the whole society is chalky block with this, is it doesn't, they don't want to go into the details. You know, it's, 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 it's looking at this in a much more comprehensive way, a much more delineate the parts of it more. That That's one of the issues. It's kind of like just point finger world, you know? Yes, yes. And, and having it be, I mean, the, the modern prison system is a product of the Enlightenment, is a product of uh, the ideas around it grew up in in the 18th century, in the age of reason. So it makes sense that it was it was meant to be a very kind of cold and rational approach as opposed to some of the uh, harsher forms of that were seen of punishment that were seen as uncivilized. So it, it was all about increments of time, sentences. Uh, let's make it nice and mathematical. You do this, you get 10 years. You do this, you get five years. Um, there's a kind of cold clinicalness to it. And that, again, is a product of the, the Enlightenment, the age of reason, the era of capitalism, where it's, okay, you do this and it costs this. Um, the era of factory building. Prisons are factories for human beings and factories of pain and punishment and harm. So it's not a surprise that they operate like that. And that is, is, is really my biggest problem with them because that's not how the world works. That's not how humanity is. Humanity is a complex entity. These kinds of issues around justice are not black and white. Um, and they're they're enormously complex. So we need to devise a system that is approximating the complexity of human beings. One of the things that you just said that it just is kind of a segue almost. The the this these blanket this is this is five years this is ten years it it doesn't make sense. I mean the difference between what you would get for murder in England or someplace and what you would get for murder in the United States yes. is it, and and how does the society benefit from these much longer prison terms in the United States? Does does is it, is it benefiting more than it, than in England? Are, are are the English you know kept safer? Exactly, and there again we see the distinction between law and morality that we were talking about. Was is it more moral uh, it, you know to kill in the UK Be, because the sentence is shorter? So does that mean the the morality is different? No, I mean, and we know that study after study again has shown that length of sentence does not increase community safety. So we're locking people away for unbelievably long periods of time, longer than any other nation in the world. In every country I went to, frankly, from Rwanda to Brazil to Norway, people, uh, incarcerated people and people who worked in the criminal justice system would look at me in shock that America had such a thing as a life sentence, even. Um, what, what, for who, who does that benefit? We're, we're costing people tax dollars. We know people age out of crime. Uh, we know that um, in many respects, recidivism rate for the recidivism rates for the crime of murder are are actually lower than for many other crimes. So it's not about public safety necessarily. Again, that's why I think it's about America's addiction to punishment and harm and being punitive, which to some extent is a product of our our Puritan. Uh, origins. What 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 happens to somebody who gets out of prison in in a 
for lack of a better term, more civilized place. What happens when they get out of prison earlier for, you know, they're, they've committed a murder or more than one murder? What, what, what kind of follow-up happens to them after they get out? I mean, how? Well, it depends where in the world. Um, in, I think in general, and I, I think this is something you can generalize around the world, there is not a very strong follow-up and reentry program in place for people coming home from prisons, which, which is one of the biggest problems with a prison-based system of justice to begin with, right? I mean, prisons, people are gonna come home from them, and they're gonna come home further damaged, they're gonna come home separated from their families, their greatest source of support, and many people's greatest source of support and emotional strength. They're gonna come home uh, separated from the job force, the workforce, the housing options. Um, so how do we deal with that? You have to have a really strong system of place if you're in, in place if you're gonna rely on prisons as a system of justice, and yet that has not been the case. I've seen very little of that almost anywhere. There are some exceptions to that, I think, globally. But uh, overall, we don't do a very good job of helping people find jobs, find housing, uh, and reacclimate to the world that they left 20 something years ago, the technology that they didn't learn. Uh, and we're only now scrambling to do that, uh, which is one of the biggest problems uh, when we set up prisons in the first place. There was no there was no net in place for the homecoming piece. What is the, if you have any insight into, and I, I assume that the reason the United States has the biggest prison population in the world, or, or most currently a, a big chunk of that has to do with the war on drugs. Um, what does that, what does that, I mean, in some neighborhoods, it's hard to come across people that haven't at some point been in prison or have a relative that's been in prison for some period of time. I mean, what does that, what's the goal of that? Well, I think the, certainly the war on drugs, as you mentioned, um, but it's also very much about systemic racism and criminalizing of particular groups, the criminalization of poverty and the criminalization of, of otherness, of black and brownness that's existed in this country for centuries. So the prison system is a direct outgrowth of that. Um, and, and again, this is true globally with other defined other populations in these countries. Um, but I think that the system, again, those of us, this is very commonly said, among those of us engaged in justice work that the system is not broken. It's designed exactly, uh, it's working exactly as it was designed to work, uh -huh. namely to oppress certain communities uh, post after slavery, uh, after reconstruction and segregation, this became the new way to keep black and brown people oppressed, keep them away from uh, full citizenship rights, keep them away from the full flourishing uh, of, of what they deserve. I mean, the book, of course, the book, The New Jim Crow, which is a, a bestseller yes, and a paradigm book. shifter, really elucidates how that happens. Michelle Both Alexander. Michelle right? Alexander, yeah. Um, elucidates how that happens for people when they go to prison and also when they come home and they become this new case uh, system, right? In, in essence, formerly incarcerated is the new black. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you had some examples of places where the situation is a bit better, right? Can you, can you give us a, a taste of what might be in the future for us? So what I, I tried to do in the book in traveling to nine countries prison systems is give a taste from each country about something that offers possibility. I'm always interested in pockets of possibility even when you know the, the whole system may be dramatically wrong but yet there's this little little uh, crack where light is coming through. But uh, I, we just talked about reentry. I actually went to Singapore which is notorious for its draconian laws around drugs. It's still caning people. It's a very very harsh system but at the same time they have a pretty incredible reentry system in place where they're finding 99 percent of people coming home from prison jobs they have engaged with the corporate sector to have them involved with uh, hiring people and giving them great benefits for hiring people coming home from prison assisting them with finding housing uh, promoting it in pop culture they have a whole campaign sort of a PR campaign around promoting the acceptance of formerly incarcerated people in the community so that's an impressive thing. Um, I did go to Norway, which is notorious for being a very uh, equitable system and a very just and equal society. And I visited the, a very famous open prison. The open prison model exists in Scandinavia. It also exists in other countries in Europe, whereby people who are incarcerated can come and go and remain connected to their communities. They sleep in the prison, but they may work jobs on the outside. They're able to go home and spend time with family, remain connected to family. Uh, 
uh, and, and, and live in very kind of holistic healing centers. I saw something similar in Australia for in a facility that was designed for 18 to 25 year old young men who are old enough to be prosecuted as adults and put in the adult system, but very vulnerable there. So they're living in uh, what struck me more as like a rehab center necessarily than a prison and looks so different from a prison as to not even be worthy of the name prison. So in these in these rehab centers in Norway, Australia, what happens when they come home at night? What, what do they get from being there rather than simply staying home with a monitor on their leg? Or well, it's for one, it's the loss of liberty that comes with um, the idea that you've committed crime. And so uh, on some level, you deserve to lose a portion of your liberty for that. Uh, but what you're also getting is programming. They have lots of uh, therapy and intensive uh, anger therapy, discussions, community building with the other people that you're incarcerated with and and time to reflect on what you've done and genuinely try to come correct uh, for the harm that you've caused. I see. I so let, can we just uh, uh, go back for a second to 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 what's considered a crime, and what's not? Looking at specifically at crimes against women and what, crimes against children. Uh, these are more recently not. I, I I was listening to a speaker on on. Uh, the Middle East, who was delineating what was happening in different countries, and he was talking about the talib I can't say this, but I'll try, talibization of the world, as and in the United States is Texas being ground zero of the talibization, you know, and they wouldn't, you know, so we're talking about fundamentalism and this this equating uh, some some idea about morality with uh, what you can do and what you can't do. Mm -hmm. um, and that seems to be the for for a while at least hopefully a short while the trend um how d these these changes in in i mean i guess it's kind of clear women the women's movement made some changes and now there's a backlash against it uh and the, the the idea that children were just property, that you could right. do whatever you wanted to? Yeah, I think that's a, I mean, it's a fascinating concept because it's not just children, obviously, who were property. It's about how a society defines personhood. And uh, a crime, I mean, slaves were property. Black people were property in this country for centuries. And even after they were freed in many respects, they, they were still considered property. And so it becomes about a crime versus this entity doesn't really count as a crime. Or even if it technically does on the law books, we're not really going to prosecute it in the way that we would prosecute a crime against a white person or a person of privilege. And that exists globally speaking. I mean, even even in a country like Uganda, where I spent some time in the prison system, um, the poor people are, yes, they're technically considered citizens, but they're, if a crime is committed against a poor person, what's the likelihood it's going to be prosecuted and someone, and someone is going to be brought to any kind of justice? Very unlikely. Uh, if a crime is committed against a wealthy politician, absolutely. And so we see that certainly there's been legal definitions of personhood that have varied in terms of women. Are women considered, are fetuses considered people, right? The crime of yes, abortion yes. is a big question in that way. Um, but I think the real the real question is who matters in a society? Who's worthy of, of us pursuing justice? for when something happens to them. In, in, in Norway, if you if you commit a crime against a poor person, are you more likely to, to be held accountable than you are in the United States? I don't have the numbers to say that. I'm not really sure. Um, so I, I couldn't answer that. But I think overall, um, there is, you know, there's a there's a commitment to bringing people to justice across the board. I spent the, the book actually starts in Rwanda, uh, a country in, that that obviously experienced one of the mass tragedies of our time, the Rwandan genocide. Yeah about 20 years ago, and uh, I was fascinated by how Rwanda, I think the world is fascinated by how Rwanda dealt with, with that horrible act, and they did not deal with it in the traditional punishment way. They really looked for a restorative justice approach, a community court approach, uh, a system of reparations across the board, whoever you were. Uh, when you were slaughtered in that genocide, you had the opportunity to have met reparations made to you and have amends made to you uh, through the community court system. Is there a kinship to that, to what they did in the Union of South Africa? Is it yeah, that, well, I went to South Africa after Rwanda and thought about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which did not work quite as well. Um, and one of the reasons it's a complicated uh, subject, why it didn't work quite as well, it's actually something that I'm looking into now as a follow-up to incarceration nation 
organizations, how truth and reconcilia reconciliation commissions do and, and don't work. But for one, we know that reparations are important. I'm sorry is not enough. Um, I'm sorry has to be connected to an action, an act. Um, and so the asking for forgiveness and all of that, the communication that happens, the verbal piece of it is one thing, but we certainly need to engage in acts of reparations. And some communities have done this better than others. Did you, in the Africa, did you come in contact with people who have been child soldiers? Yes. In, in the Ugandan system, I taught a creative writing class in Uganda in a notorious prison called Luzira, and uh, two of my students had been child soldiers, and which is, of course, the, the, the very thing that should get you thinking about who is in our prison system and the ways in which, again, the quote-unquote offenders have been deeply victimized as well. Yes, it's, it's extraordinary, this thing of being forced into this and, and playing upon uh, not just fear, but childish uh, conceptions of how the world works, mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. uh, and I w I'm sure I would imagine that happens to a lot of people who get involved in crimes. Uh, there seems to be you know two doors, three doors, and I just choose the one that looks the best. It happens to be no good, but or yeah, or you don't choose. I mean, uh, what is that even a choice? If mm -hmm. you're if you grow up in an impoverished community, a community that has no social services or has minimal social services, minimal education, um, and and so on, is it really is it is it really a choice at that point? You're essentially being conditioned, uh, and that's why I think you know among the philosophers I, I quote in in my book are the philosophers who talk about like Sir Thomas More who talked about we're we're creating scapegoats. What does it mean to create a criminal and then severely flog that criminal? That is the essence of scapegoating. So as we move, are we going to move away? From, we're going to eventually move away from scapegoating if we if we continue to exist. Um, have you seen places? So. Yeah. Have you seen places? I'm going to hold up the book too because we're common. It's been a delightful conversation. As 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 as, as we as we move, you know, past this election, I, I like to date these things. So we're August 27th, uh, 2016. There's a really a a, a a joining of 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 issues in in, in white nationalism versus uh, mm -hmm. the establishment. You know, I mean, that's really what we have the choice of here. Um, a very depressing choice. Yes, a very depressing choice. So, 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 do you see places where it's moving I I inside the United States, or we have to go to Canada? No, I absolutely think. I mean, I, I work in the justice system here. I, I started a program called the Prison to College Pipeline. I'm engaged in it here, and I'm around so many incredible change makers. And I do think that we've hit something of a tipping point where we recognize that this cannot give. Not only because we are going broke as a result of it, but because there is a recognition that this is this is not right. So we're going to have to say uh, goodbye, and uh, I could go on, but we're going to go goodbye. Goodbye.